So if you don't want to appear in the recording, go ahead and uh, turn off your cameras. Um, but yeah, we'll get started. Um, let me just check. There's a chat here. Um, Robin, I'm aware of the, uh, yeah, it was kind of, we started recording a little bit late. Um, I will recap. Um, so that covered Grace's aspect of this study, looking at the turf and meadow insect pollinators. And basically what she did was catch cups. So she dis distributed um, UV colored cups with soapy water and then uh, looked at the bees that were attracted that fell into the cup um, and looked at the bee diversity that she found. Um, I'm happy to fill in any details or uh, we can kind of uh, talk about it later, but it's not super relevant tonight. We're talking about other sampling methods, but I do apologize for that. We, we forgot to start recording at the beginning of that session. Um, yeah, feel free to ask questions if um, that comes up, but we will get started. So this is part two of our talk um, I'm Maria Paula Mignani. I'm the Director of Research and Restoration at the Pennypack Ecological Restoration Trust. Um, I'm here at Brynathen College. Grace McMacken's in the audience. She says hi. Um, <laughs> and we are the two um, kind of primary investigators in this research in um, a very um, interactive and fun partnership between the college and the trust doing some research. So. We'll get started as a continuation of last week. All right. So turf and lawn. Uh, our nation has a pretty big in infatuation with this land cover type. Um, it's kind of hard to blame us, right? It's very uniform. It's aesthetically pleasing. All we have to do is mow it. Um, and, you know, there is some work involved in making it uniform, getting rid of those pesky weeds that like to pop through. Um, what may, many of us may not know is these grasses that we have in our lawns are called cool season grasses. So they f grow in a mat formation rather than warm season grasses, which grow in clumps. And they're typically fescues, bluegrasses, uh, Kentucky bluegrass is a big one. Um, and they don't mind that cool weather. They, uh, as you've noticed now that it's spring, they green up pretty quickly, uh, despite it still being cool out. And they uh, don't die back in brown as readily as our warm season grasses in the fall do. If you walked Raytharn uh, grasslands at the Trust, you've seen a lot of those tall grasses, things like lopsided Indian grass, and little blue stem, uh, the broom sedges, those are all warm season grasses. Uh, they grow tall, they form, uh, they grow in clumps and they go dormant in the fall. So you start to see them brown and, and kind of um, die back a little bit. So those are different kinds of grasses. These are nice mat forming, cool weather tolerant grasses. Um, now, the way we manage these uh, this lane cover type is usually warm season months. As soon as April hits, we're mowing these, uh, our lawns one to two times a week. So if you're thinking April to October, I'm cutting that lawn, that works out to be about 14 to 28 times a year we're cutting our lawns. So as you can imagine, and you pretty well know, that's not a lot of time for things to regrow because we don't want it to and not a lot of space for insects to establish themselves and really take advantage of the flora within our lawns. Uh, and we try to compensate for this in our lawns by planting other things, right? Uh, some nice boxwood here, some shrubs, some um, azaleas we have blooming right now, lots of different flowers um, that we plant in our beds. And a lot of these are not native, they don't flower for very often, or they're just not recognizable um, as uh, a necessary or helpful aspect to an insect's life stages. They're not very functional for an insect's um, life and its needs. Uh, what we need for an insect to thrive is, and I've broken this down into three 
kind of basic tenants, but there's lots of ways you can think about this. They need structure. So they need um, different types of vegetation that have kind of multi-level growth heights and, and different attributes to give them habitat to live in, to be safe, to mate in, all that. So that's structure. They need food. So let's talk about um, pollen and nectar via the flowers that they consume from plants, but also the leaf matter, right? Their larval stages, those caterpillars, they need leaves to um, eat as well. Uh, and then also I'm calling this life stage hosts, but you know, areas to reproduce. Um, and oftentimes for our uh, native insects, they are looking for a particular um, host plant that they're recognizing that will be good for their larvae to eat. So a lot of times that's a plant they've co-evolved with. Um, in this case, this is um, a great leopard moth uh, that's laid its eggs in a cluster, but some species of butterfly, they'll lay one egg at one plant at a time and they just kind of bop around, lay an egg here, a, lay an egg, an egg here. And it has to be a plant they recognize that's a host that will be nutritious for their larvae once they hatch. So that can be a tall order in our lawn landscapes where they don't really recognize anything and nothing's really grown enough above ground biomass to really provide that structure and that food and you know reliable longstanding food for when their larvae hatch. So um, right now our lawns aren't really offering that as they are in their constantly mowed form. I suspect I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. A lot of you can understand this on a basic level. Um, but part of the problem here in southeastern PA is our grasslands also have a legacy of disturbance, right? A lot of them were pasture for livestock. They were farmed. Maybe they were um, there was a paper mill nearby like the Pennypack Trust had. Um, these areas have been disturbed for 250 years. And even more after we built houses on them. So unfortunately in our area, we have to combat invasive and non-native plants on a, on a greater scale than the rest of the state. Um, and that means our native plants have been outcompeted in that process. They can't proliferate, they can't spread quite as fast as these invasive plants. And not to mention they're, they're kind of in check, right? Some of those insects that are feeding on their leaves are kind of keeping their populations down at the same time. Um, but at the same time in these grasslands, um, and I'm this picture here is actually some meadow in the county um, that we sampled in. These areas are also kind of comparable to our lawns. Um, we're trying to keep them looking nice. So mowing management is a priority here, but we also, um, don't want to get too into the weeds with aesthetics, but not let them go overgrown. So you're, you're kind of battling with like, oh, I want, um, I want to mow this to keep it, um, keep it looking neat and tidy, but I don't want to mow it to an inch of its life, but I want to consider aesthetics. It's, it's kind of a battle here and then throw the invasive non-native plants on top. Um, and if you're looking for uniformity in the landscape, um, you're not going to get it, or it's going to be really tough. And I mean that in our lawns and in our meadows. So uh, I want to pivot now to talk about the areas we researched, we did our sampling in. Um, many of you are familiar with the landscape here. In yellow is the trust's um, owned land, part of the preserve. And we wanted to look at cool season grass to um, look at what life it can support. Now we don't have a whole lot of it. A lot of our grasslands have been restored to be tall grass, warm season prairie on purpose. We do have a small area that's technically an orchard. It's just over two and a half acres, but we looked to form a relationship with the cathedral landscape in Brynathen. Here in this black dotted lot, we have, um, three different landowners that you can see are a really nice extension of our own preserve. So that flows really nicely um, with our work. And that's um, land owned, there's B99 
owned by the Academy of the New Church. There's what we call the estate landscape owned by the General Church of the New Jerusalem. And what we call Quarry Road because of the intersecting road that's owned by the borough of Bryn Athen. So these three property owners um, and, and frankly collaborators in our work, um, they joined and were interested in our research and agreed to host our study of the, these grasslands to see what, what, what their conditions are currently um, and, and how we can start to think about these as functional landscapes. Think of them, oh, they're a little bit different than the average lawn, right? But um, comparable in many ways. And just to give you kind of a more familiar view here without the GIS layers, this is the same landscape. And notice they flow right into each other. And indeed, they are very similar in terms of the plant composition um, as uh, we've discussed in part one and in insect composition. Um, here are some pictures of the cathedral landscape. You can see the Bernathan Cathedral in the background. So these areas have um, been mowed three or four times a year for many years. And the, the it's kind of the idea is to maintain some grassland habitat there but also have a nice rolling hills aesthetic that's very characteristic with this area. So uh, a marriage between the two is, 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 is paramount here. Um, so our, our kind of overarching question here is, is, yeah, you can see there's quite a bit of plants in here. Um, what native organisms can this landscape support? What sort of plants do we have in here? What sort of um, insects do we have? Um, and this is a, a nice little representation of our trophic levels locally here in southeastern Pennsylvania. We have at the very bottom our primary producers, our, our plants that produce all the energy that flows up through the levels. So then we have our, um, our, our herbivores, our omnivores, and then our carnivores. So for our study, we wanted to focus at the very foundation of these um, levels of, of our ecological community. Um, not only because um, the, they're basically the foundation that feeds the rest of the system, but you know, pollinators specifically uh, you know, keep our plant communities healthy, help pro proliferate our native plants. They're essential to our ecosystem. So specifically with insects, we wanted to focus on three main orders. That's the butterflies and moths, Lepidoptera, Hymenoptera, the bees and wasps, and Diptera, the flies. And because we had some very happy uh, entomologists on board, there's a few kind of uh, <laughs> opportunistic orders that were also sampled. Uh, we can't really help ourselves. We like insects. So those are our three main groups. Uh, so the idea here is to obtain a baseline understanding of what these cool season grasslands host. And this could give us a little more information about what your lawns could host and where, where can we move from those lawns in terms of native restoration or supporting native pollinators. So the first question here is what, what plants are in these grasslands? Are they native? Are they non-native? Are they invasive? And, and once we determine that, what are the insect pollinators here? Um, what, what species are present within those orders? Or, you know, more realistically, as, as Grace talked about in the last talk, um, what genera are present? Because it can be tricky to identify the species. And then what are the interactions, the pollinator plant interactions? What's being pollinated on this landscape? And that's all kind of under this umbrella of mowing frequency and timing. So these landscapes, like I said, were mowed three to four times a year traditionally, just to keep up the aesthetics, but keep it a, a you know somewhat functional um, system. But we wanted to toy with bringing that down a little bit more. So we chose two mowing periods during the summer. One was late June and the other was late September. And these are, partially based on the needs of our property owners, um, you know, some events they have during the year, 4th of July, but also thinking, okay, 
We want to delay mowing a little bit because we've got early spring emergers, early spring emerging insects that need this, uh, need the flowers that would exist before June. And also we want to mow not too late into the fall because we need some regrowth to happen to support any eggs that are laid by insects and, and have that those standing um, stems that Grace talked about that can support nesting and, and all that. So we want to leave some habitat up to overwinter. So those are the two uh, periods uh, and the timing. Now I'll give you a little sneak peek of what our sampling looked like. We had 18 points per site and we sampled every three weeks at each site. So we're, we're quite busy during the growing season. Um, this was April through October that we sampled. Um, and I can, talk, I'll, I can talk about this more in the Q&A part, but there's some breakdown to this sampling. We wanted to include edge habitat in our consideration. Um, so basically when we sampled the plant uh, the, to look at what insects were present, and what their interactions were, we ran transects, 100 foot transects at every point that you saw on that previous map. And this is a cute little illustration to kind of show you, but we had a quadrat that we ran for every 10 feet along this 100 foot transect. So here's a quick little illustration of, um, of our entomologist checking at every 10 foot interval and looking at you know, were, were, were there flowers there? Noting the flowering plants. And then if there are any pollinators present. Now, as you might suspect, as this, um, as this vegetation grew a little taller, we would hold the frame a little bit above the plants to not disturb the insects, you know, to fly away before we can identify them. And for some of the bees, we, um, to be able to identify them, we actually use a handheld vacuum cleaner to collect them which a lot of people had questions about, but we found very um, useful. Now for the vegetation surveys, we laid out the same kind of quadrats at every point. So 18 points, and this was done on a three week, week rotation as well. Now, if you look at this quadrat, it doesn't look like a whole lot in there, right? Like there's the grass, there, you can see some broad leaves in here. And really there's quite a bit you can uncover in here. Um, so a lot of it is uh, non-native, unfortunately, but, you know, way more diverse than I would have even guessed when I walked through before sampling. Now, we found 81 species. I'm, I'm talking about this kind of collectively across all three sites rather than to tell you each site, because as it turns out, they're very similar in composition. Um, so, Overall, we're finding about 60% non-native species. Now, all on, in uh, scientists who have done this similar kind of work, looking at um, insect and plant interactions, have found that maybe you know about 38% of non-native species is your maximum threshold for. Um, for your community. So having more than that means you're not able to support as many pollinator, as much pollinator diversity. Um, we did have 40% uh, native, but obviously this is, this is quite a bit of non-native. Now, when I show you what was the most well distributed here, you're gonna be a little disappointed. <laughs> um, porcelainberry was basically in every quadrat. Um, throughout these sites. We also had a lot of Japanese honeysuckle, um, Japanese stiltgrass. I'm sure every one of you has this in your lawn. Um, poison ivy is native. We had that. And then dogbane. Dogbane was like king out here. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. It has to do with how it spreads. But um, basically, yeah, a lot of non-native um, European non-native kind of agricultural weedy species, and then invasive vines that we all know and love uh, if you work at the trust. Overall, looking at all the insects that we uh, captured doing this survey method, uh, a vast majority were of Hymenoptera, so, and that's our bees um, and wasps. 
Um, we did have a good amount that was, oops, sorry, uh, that were flies. And that was really surprising to me. I hadn't realized that flies were such a, a common presence in, in terms of flower pollination. And we had a, a good amount of beetles as well. Um, I think our flower, our Lepidoptera captures were a little on the low side because there was some disturbance in just walking up to the sample point as opposed to just standing in an area and watching them come to a flower. So I think that does kind of affect what you see. But yeah, our, most of the, the bees are doing the heavy lifting in terms of pollination in these sites. And surprise, surprise, the biggest heavy lifter here is the European honeybee. I think Grace already spoiled that surprise last time. That's what she found in her catch cups that she distributed throughout these sites as well. So our uh, sampling links up well. And the big theme here is the generalist pollinators dominate. Like Grace, we also found the sweat bees in Holictidae, um, specifically the genus Glossioglossum, which um, looks a little like a fly if you see it around. It's, you probably have seen it and thought, that's a fly, and it's really a little sweat bee. Um, those were also heavy lifters in terms of pollinators on these three sites. Um, I also want to give a nod to the bumblebees. Uh, there are 28 species in Eastern US and Canada. Um, we found four of them. And, you know, including, you know, the, what we see a lot here, common Eastern bumblebee, the fondus and patience, that one you see everywhere. These guys are very broad generalists. So as we're happy to see them and, uh, but, you know, not telling us a whole lot about uh, more specialist interactions. They, they like what's there. Now, I think I know better and you know better than to fall for this guy in the middle here, right? Well, Grace kind of tested your knowledge. This is actually one we found a greater bee fly. This guy looks a lot like a bumblebee. Um, this is a parasite bee, uh, parasite fly. You can tell it's got short antenna and two wings. And it actually um, will deposit its eggs in the ground nests of bees. And then their larvae go in, they eat the pollen, and then they also eat the bee larvae as well. So pretty greedy. Um, and they'll do this like when they see the bumble, like the bee go off and go collect more pollen, they'll go in and drop the eggs in there uh, in between to kind of sneak in. So, but really cool that we found it. It's, it's pretty common, honestly, and also pretty broad generalist as well. But I thought it was really, really interesting to see them out there. Um, in terms of Lepidoptera, I did some uh, extra sampling, just kind of pollard walks, walking around, um, not sticking to the transect um, areas, just to see what we had. And we have your typical monarch, Eastern tiger swallowtail, your black swallowtail, American lady. Um, you've got those, um, non-native cabbage whites as well, but we also have notably some skippers, um, grass skippers, and these guys are avid nectarers, but they are generalists as well. Um, they specifically would go for um, wild basil, which is in the mint family, but it's uh, naturalized from Europe. It's, it's pretty common around here. They love the dog bane and they love the clovers. So, um, these, these two specific skippers we had the most were Peck skippers and the silver spotted skipper. And uh, I one uh, one thing I thought really interesting to to reason why I'm talking about them so much is it, it proves a point um, that you have to think beyond a grassland when you're thinking about your insect pollinators. So the silver spotted skipper has quite a few larval hosts, you know, places where it will lay its eggs. And one of them are black locusts. So when you're thinking about our insect pollinators, you also have to consider what other life stages need. And that begs the question of connectivity on our landscape. So, you know, we can, we're researching these grasslands, but we also have to think, all right, the larvae are being supported by black locusts that are at the trust, or maybe they're in somebody's yard, 
or um, maybe they're on the edge of the grassland. You really, it, 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 you really have to think about um, what their needs are and how they're being supplied. So in this case, we're fortunate that the trust is really adjacent to this landscape, but other people with lawns, let's say you want that silver spotted skipper, you have to think about how you can support that larval stage if you wanna host it in your lawn. And then hopefully there are, um, that's really speaks to increasing tree diversity and, and other hosts that you don't think of in the grassland landscape. Um, another thing of note is the pex skipper, the larvae feed on or uh, orchard grass, which you've all seen this, I know you have. It's in like every agricultural field. Um, it is not native. This is a European grass, but this is an example of the skipper um, being able to adapt to what grasses are available and lay its eggs on the grasses and, and do just fine. Their populations are pretty strong. Um, and a lot of guides even to this point will put, hey, larval host orchard grass. Like it's become that common and it's practically naturalized here. So I thought that was really interesting that a non-native plant can kind of become an accepted larval host for something that's native to our area. So some things to think about. Something that really surprised me was um, we had a lot of early spring emerger pollinators. And uh, we, we talked to the Xerces Society and they were like, oh, you know, maybe wait until May or June to really start sampling because there's not a whole lot. Um, but in fact, we, we this, these grasslands can actually support um, quite a range of bees really early on. Um, and I, I like to think we, because we didn't mow until late June, we were able to, to, to support that need. As they're emerging in April, um, they have uh, plants, they have flowering plants to, to feed on. So a lot of these you'll recognize from Grace's talk. Um, of course, the honeybees are there in April, but we also have several Helictidae, sweat bees, representatives, the Lossio Glossum, um, we have the bicolored strips, Sw sweat bee, all of these guys are generalists, the small carpenter bee, the minor bee, all of these were out in April, which I, I, I might be alone in this, but that really surprised me. Like I would have thought May, once the temperatures are stabilized um, and, and there's more floral diversity, they'd be out, but it's in April. So to me, that really says like, we need to have we need to have flora, we need to have flowers available to them to support these early emergers. Because if you look at other species, they come out where you would expect more like May or June. And this is what their top visited flowering plants are. And I'm sure a lot of you will go, oh, those are in my lawn. I hate them. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think, there's a lot to be said for participating in that Nomo May. Um, yes, they're non-native, but we, we live in southeastern Pennsylvania where invasive and non-native plants are everywhere. And um, I think it, it, it pays to just delay that mowing um, into the end of May just to be able to support these early emergers as they come out. Um, it's just part of our reality. And um, you're not going to find a whole ton of other plants. I mean, you could go for spring ephemerals that will also flower. If you're into that, I, you could go the native spring ephemeral route. Um, but I, I say for the average lawn owner, there's, there's no shame. It's better than no nectar. Um, so that's kind of our one of our umbrella themes here, like we already have an invaded landscape. So if you're not a, a nature preserve or you're going to strive for that extra mile of like looking at establishing native ephemerals on your property, um, which are hard to do from seed and even bare root. Um, no, non-native nectar is better than no nectar. Um, and we can talk about this in the Q and A, but I'm sure you all recognize these from your lawns. Um, I, I, I think it's, uh, it supports our idea of no mow may, delaying mowing, um, just to have this nectar for them. 
all that are not native? That's correct. <laughs> yeah, a lot of European uh, kind of weedy agricultural plants here. Yeah, non-native. Now I wanna pivot here to talk about the star plant insect interactions. Now the star of, uh, of our research was dog bane, or it's often called Indian hemp. This is the same family as the milkweeds and people often confuse them as milkweeds. Um, they're just related. They're, it's obviously a very different flower. Um, they are native and I think one of the reasons so the best, I'll just skip ahead here. So looking at our three sites, they are between 17 and 30% of the total pollination events. So that means that, you know, there was a site where 30% uh, of our insects that we observed were feeding on dog bane. So that's, that's, a, that's quite a lot. Um, everything, there's, there's some runners up and we'll talk about that but there was a, a heavy reliance on dog bane. And I think part of that is just, they're aggressive. The, um, it flowers May to August, so that's a nice long time to, to be able to rely on those flowers. Um, a lot of things are more like May to June and then like July to September. Like it's it, having that for that long of a stretch is, is kind of a boon uh, for flowering. They're also able to re-sprout pretty readily after mowing. And so the, the USDA considers this a high value pollinator nectar plant. Um, all the parts are toxic. That's what the dog bane refers to. So um, dogs, livestock, the, the, these are toxic. I, I wouldn't say there's like a, a high danger, uh, you know, any sort of, you should be worried about them, but that is, what the name refers to. Um, but what's most interesting is this is an aggressive plant. So it, it does get pollinated and you will see the seeds and the pods, um, but it is, it's a clonal plant. So from those rhizomes, it produces more and more plants. And that's why you often see it in a, in a thick, dense colony all together. And oftentimes you'll see one plant if it's just starting out and then like 10 feet later, another plant, more than likely that's a same genetic individual. It will send its rhizomes, like its runners down underneath, you know, underground pretty far away. So a lot of its, its um, reproduction is actually just replication through its rhizomes. So the average, you know, this is a great pollinator plant to have. It's pretty easy to get going, but you do have to watch out because it will, be really aggressive and, and might displace some other natives. Um, something uh, that was uh, interesting of note, we uh, the dog bane tiger moth, um, this is a native moth we have, it's pretty heavily reliant on feeding on the dog bane. And you'll see these diurnally um, on the landscape, just uh, feeding. Uh, but yeah, basically everything, all the insects we saw, they all wanted a taste of dog bane. And so heavy reliance on that nectar. Um, some runners up that were also uh, popular for our pollinators. Horse blueberry, uh, which we all know this is a uh, very common invasive vine from Southeast Asia. This is one of our top, um, our top displacers at the trust. Uh, really grows in thick mats and, and smothers everything. Uh, but it flowers in um, kind of the, the May, June window um, and provides nectar and that was popular. Um, I will say that these were mostly on the edge of our plots. So areas that didn't quite get mowed all the way, that was included in the study. We wanted to include edge and so that's a little food for thought, right? Like you gotta pay attention to your edge because um, that's where these actually will flower um, and fruit eventually. Um, our narrow leaf plantain, um, this is actually a pride, predominantly wind pollinated as a species. It's non-native from Europe. 
Um, a lot of places it's called, it's considered a noxious weed, another kind of agricultural weed, but it does produce pollen and the flies especially love it. Um, the bees will go after it as well. Um, and they just form these kind of mats as plantain typically does. It does well in disturbance. It drops a bunch of little seeds that will blow around. And so it can spread pretty effectively. Um, the other the other one we have here, it's, it's very common in our landscape, but it is non-native, Queen Anne's lace. Um, this is also popular for our pollinators. Um, and also very aggressive. So if you're noticing a trend here, you're right. So all of these, including the dog bane, they thrive in disturbance, kind of poorer soils. They can tolerate poorer conditions. Um, some of them are invasive. Um, most of them are, are non-native um, and they can aggressively spread in, in poor conditions and outcompete things. So, um, it's it's kind of like chicken and the egg, right? Like, are the pollinators? Um, it's basically like the they're these guys do so well on the landscape that um, they're 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 they end up being a huge pollen or nectar source for our insects. So they're being supported um, by these non-natives, and they're generalists, so they can get by. Um, despite them not being native or having not co-evolved. Um, it's nectar, and so they'll, they'll go for it. Some other um, runner up here, um, we had several goldenrod species um, that, the, that are native that were also um, tar heavily targeted um, to a lesser degree than the ones we talked about um, by our pollinators, mostly bees, and then also yarrow, um, which we know to be native, that also was a okay. um, Horse nettle, we um, have quite a bit of that on the landscape. I'm sure some of you have that in your, your lawns if you've let it go longer. Um, this is native um, and we were really excited to find uh, one of its hosts, which is actually a moth here. Um, this is called a Riley's Clearwing, it looks like a little, um, uh, like a hornet, but um, it's actually a moth mimicking that. And um, its host plant is this horse nettle, which is also considered a kind of agricultural weedy plant. And um, it's, it's actually, its larvae will bore into the root system, and uh, but relies on that. And they're really beautiful, like their wings, the, the clear wing refers to their interesting um, and really beautiful wings that almost look like stained glass. So I thought that was another fun thing uh, we found that um, it's not like a very, it, it's not like a rare, but it's a, it was a treat to see like a moth. Um, you don't see that every day. Um, another interesting um if you recall, the flies were around 20% of our uh, insects on the landscape. Uh, and that order is mostly consisted of hoverflies, specifically the margined calligrapher fly, which is part of a uh, surfidae. They're called hoverflies or surfid flies. These are a bee mimic. And they'll actually, you can see that through their colors. Um, I think sometimes they, they, the, the little tip at the end, it, it, it's arguable like bee mimic, wasp mim mimic. Um, the, the little bottom here is meant to almost look like a stinger. Um, it, the, so those colors can fool, uh, can fool you or also there's a little bit of buzzing it does that also makes it seem like it's a bee. Um, these feed on both nectar and pollen. They were frequent pollinators of our um, uh, uh, lance leaf plantain, as you can see here. And they're often there to just hover, grab a little nectar, and they incidentally get a little pollen on their bodies. And they're so they're kind of accidental pollinators. What's really interesting about them is they have some implications for agricultural pest control. They will lay their eggs on plants. 
And when those larvae hatch, they're one of their main targets for food are aphids. So I, there's been some investigation in their value as pest control in agricultural landscapes. But they just zip around, hovering around all, all these plants. Um, and really interesting, I had never noticed them before. So um, thinking about these grasslands now, back to those three main tenants that we talked about, um, you know, there is obviously structure in there. We had a lot of different grasses um, and herbaceous plants in there, plenty to, to have live out your life stages and forage in. There is food. It is, uh, you know, there's the native dog bane, but by and large, it is non-native or invasive food. Um, and some of these uh Insects are so have become so generalist that they've kind of adapted. I want to use that word kind of loosely, but they've they've come to terms with what's in the landscape and they will lay eggs on things. Um, for example, like we saw with the skipper uh, laying eggs on the non-native orchard grass. Um, it's it's. It's interesting to think about, I had never anticipated, I didn't anticipate finding this many insects. Um, uh, it was, it is way more diverse than I expected, but the real question is how, you know, these are pretty functional as, as they are with non-native plants, but to attract um, a little bit more diversity, more than just the honeybees and the generalist bees, it, it, it might be worth exploring, introducing more native plants to the landscape. But that ultimately depends on what your goals are and, and how you can anticipate long-term management, um, integrating native plants in here. Um, so these landscapes right now, like we said, are mowed two times a year. And I don't think we can go just based off the amount of invasive plants we have in here, tons of porcelainberry, um, tons of Japanese honeysuckle. If we were to stop mowing this permanently, those would just take over. And that's just the reality of where we are. Um, there's a landscape really nearby to this one that's kind of grassland, shrubland, and it doesn't get mowed very often. And it is just overwhelmed with porcelainberry. Um, and so in, in this case, we, we can't stop mowing, but delaying mowing um, at this point in the study, uh, obviously we, we need to, we would need more data to say something concrete, but um, you know, we're supporting a lot of um, early emergers by delaying mowing. Um, I like to think that by leaving standing vegetation uh, to overwinter, we're supporting reproduction and, and egg laying and, and leaving structure up for habitat. Um, going back to the larval stages and the larval needs of a lot of these insects, I wouldn't be surprised if the preserve and adjacent properties to this grasslands are supporting some of the other life stages, some of the, the caterpillars that are hosted by um, oaks, or like we said, the black locust um, are, are probably elsewhere, and then they move to this grassland landscape. Again, when we mow this area, those two times of year, they are probably going to like the Brunathan Cathedral for some nectar or, or other um, house residential lawns nearby that have flowers. Um, I, I do think that introducing some native plants could imp in, um, improve that plant diversity, but there need to be a lot of work to tackle the invasive plants first, because I think they would pretty quickly outcompete um, any native plants that were introduced. And of course, there need to be a lot of planning to um, consider the methods uh, first. But, you know, I, my, my big takeaway will be just like, wow, this is non-native predominantly, and there's, there's a lot of insects in here. Um, 
So if we think about your lawn, other turf land, it's probably similarly dominated by native and generalist insect pre pollinators like we saw. Um, I, I think based off our uh, work, delaying mowing would be something you would want to consider doing. And if you want to take a step from there to support those three tenants of pollinators, there's a few ways you could approach that. Um, in terms of mowing your lawn, you could think about uh, staggering maybe the front and the back lawn uh, when you mow those. So do one first and then the other so that there's somewhere where pollinators can go, um, you know, uh, assuming that you have something for them to, uh, something for them to pollinate or some, some structure for them to live in, in either of those two. Um, you could plant some native garden beds um, that's for somebody who doesn't really want to mess with their lawn. Um, and if you if you don't really want to mess with um, the overall composition of your lawn, you could leave some standing areas, um, maybe they're discrete areas to overwinter. Those are kind of like three quick ways to think about this, but I, I want to go into more of the thought process here before I close. So the first thing I think you should always do is consider how much time and effort you want to dedicate. What, what's your end goal here? Do you want it to look pretty? Do you want a combination of, of, of aesthetics and functionality? Um, do you want just to mow a path and be done with it? Like how, how much can you really change this landscape? Are you concerned about neighbors? Um, there's a lot of things to think about first. And maybe that's a front lawn, back lawn consideration. Maybe like I want to keep my front lawn mode for, for aesthetics, but the back, I have more liberty there. So I'll think about that. That's your first step. And then I recommend that you start small. So leave an area unmown. That could be like a strip or like half your lawn or just, just a small area and then see what comes up in there. Um, it's probably going to be a mix a while of, of non-native or invasive flowers and grasses first. And over time, if you let those grasses grow, maybe that'll, they might outcompete. It really depends. The grasses may outcompete your herbaceous plants. It really depends what composition you have. Um, I will reiterate that when you think about our landscape, our residential landscape, where everything's just mown down to the quick, any nectar or pollen that you can keep, um, provided that you don't let like the porcelain berry go to fruit, just cut that off, um, it's better than nothing. A another thing you could do is um, move, raise your mo uh, mower deck higher and um, kind of adjust if your grasses are, are competing. Um, think about like how high you're mowing versus uh, how frequently you're mowing. Um, if you don't want to leave, uh, just like cut a, a, a small area, if you don't want to change your mowing habits, I would, I would consider maybe, um, mowing paths instead and either gardening that out. So like planting native in, in beds, making it more functional, but kind of a little bit more manicured in terms of planting native wildflowers, you could do, um, this is uh, an example I took from Refugia. It's a native landscaping company in our state. Um, they, they offer a range of different methods. I think it's um, just interesting to look at their, how they've laid out the lawns of some of their clients. Um, this is not sponsored by the way. I just, I'm interested in their work. <laughs> um, so in this area, this was all lawn and they decided to integrate native wildflowers almost like a garden. So they planted clustered of the same species throughout and it's, you know, it's tall, it's overgrown, but it looks more uh, purposeful, right? It's not neglect, it's planned. So uh, making a garden bed um, whether that's on a big scale like this or smaller beds, 
might be a good start rather than just letting your whole lawn go or part of your lawn go. Um, obviously, when you're looking at native plants, and I'll share some resources, you can look at, uh, you want to look at what light and soil conditions you have before you pick them out. Those, that'll determine what you plant. And also thinking about when things are in flower, maybe you want to do successional planting. So plant something to flower in the summer and then swap it out for a fall planter. Or just thinking about when things bloom is important when you plan this sort of thing. Um, and then you can just, your only mowing will just be mowing paths through. Um, that's an option as well. Um, I'm going to just show a few examples of other work they've done here, integrating native plants. So this is a little bit more wild looking. They've, they've let the grass grow and they've actually planted plugs right into the grass, you know, um, digging away the grass, clearing it and, and planting the plugs in there. Um, this other one here has integrated almost like uh, your typical landscaped flowers, but they've put in native plants instead and mixed grass, native grass textures um, and herbaceous blooming plants um, in there to make it native, but landscape looking. It really depends what sort of look you're looking for and um, what time and, and effort you're willing to put in. Here's another example of they, they let the grass grow um, and then they either seeded or put in plugs and this looks a little bit more wild, a little more um, tame, but this works for, for their landscape. So just a few things, um, different looks that you might want to consider. Um, one last note I had. Now, I remember I mentioned that some of our plots were in edge habitat. So they weren't, they were like along fence lines, kind of on the edge with forest. I know a lot of you have those areas in your lawns, right? And they're probably full of like wineberry, uh, Japanese honeysuckle, probably some privet in there, anything that invasive that just loves that light um, and hasn't been dealing with the wrath of your mower, that's going to be hiding out in there. Um, and that's what we found in our study. A lot of the porcelain berry pollination was on the edge where um, it was allowed to flower and then it went to fruit because it wasn't mowed. So as opposed to the rest of the grassland, which it flowered, but then right before it fruited, it was mowed. So you're contributing to the seed load um, in the seed bank in terms of invasive species. So I encourage you to think more about your edge habitat because I know you have it and think either selective removal, starting to get, get um, chip away at those uh, invasive plants that are hiding in there. This might be a good place to introduce native shrubs. Never mind the herbaceous plants. How about some shrubs? Those support a lot of pollinators. Um, and there's, there's quite a few to pick from. Um, this might be a spot for integrating what Grace talked about in her first talk with um, having some standing stems overwintering through um, one spring all the way to the next spring because that's how bees nest. This might be a nice discreet place to leave those stems up. There's quite a few, well, I won't say quite a few, but there's several shade and part shade native species that you can plant out along this edge as well. And as long as you're willing to keep an eye on it, if, if if there are invasive vines moving in, this might be another place to expand your native impact. So just a little thing to think about in terms of your edge, which I'm sure gets neglected sometimes. Um, and here's a caught in the act, the uh, honeybee pollinating uh, porcelain berry flowers. Here are, I'm um, just gonna reiterate a few of the plants that we recommend that are uh, high value native plants, uh, species for pollinators. I'm sure you're familiar. These are kind of the classics. Um, some of them are fall bloomers and some are for summer. And so um, there's plenty of resources out there that'll tell you how they'll fare in light or uh, different soil conditions. I also recommend if you're thinking, if you're having trouble like 
picturing a layout for if you want to do a native bed. Um, the Audubon Mid-Atlantic chapter has a lot of diagrams depending on your conditions that you can check out and they suggest some plants that would work well together, some nice color combos. Um, to, and it tells you, you know, this is for full sun, dry soil. And it's, it's a great little diagram to help you plan that out. And they've got tons of versions of this. So that's another resource to use. So I want to close here because I'm seeing the chat is, has some questions. Um, I want to Give a special thanks to our property partners, the Academy of the New Church, the General Church of the New Jerusalem, and the Borough of Bryn Athen. We couldn't have done this research without them. They're, they've been very curious and interested in our research, um, and we'll be in contact with them. Uh, we've had a great collaboration. Uh, I want to thank Grace McMacken for being my B specialist and, and always being um, helpful with our sampling and, and just being a great partner to work with. Uh, Sarah Pelleccio, she was our former staff entomologist. She's now in the Peace Corps in Senegal doing great things. She was a great proponent of refining these methodologies that we've now um, made for this sampling. And then her intern, Katie Lynn Chafin, has also gone on to great things. I want to thank them for their hard work doing um, a bunch of this sampling. And I want to close here, open it up for questions, but here are quite a few learning resources, whether you want to start thinking about planting, um, how to pick flowers. Um, Prairie Moon Nursery is out in the Midwest, but it's a, it's got a great collection of native plants and great information. But uh, you know, you could just look to your local uh, groups here for help. And there's a PA, Native Plant Society, Brandywine Conservancy. And look at that, the Pennypack Trust is actually having a native plant sale uh, on May 6th. So we'll be selling a whole range of uh, native plants, a lot of them that were mentioned tonight. And you can look on our events calendar for our full list of species that will be there. Um, and a great way to support your local land trust and get some great native plants out of it. So thank you and we'll open it up for questions. I know that was a lot of information at once. <laughs> any, any, I'm gonna start with the live audience here. Any questions? Yeah, Sam. Um, so, I know with, uh, you mentioned that um, a lot of the following years are being on non native species. That's right. kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I know with like birds, like birds will eat berries of like non native species, and some of them are toxic to the birds. Has there been any like developments in whether or not some of these non native species might be toxic to the insects that are feeding on them? Uh -huh. Yeah, them. go ahead. Um, generally, the Pollen and nectar aren't the, the places where the plants put their chemical defenses in. So the things that really have to worry about are the things that in their larval stage um, eat leaf tissue, so like the caterpillars and stuff. But um, in terms of just getting pollen and nectar, they're, if they can find it, they can eat it. Okay. I will say that, um, Echoing what Grace, so the, so the question was, are, have there been cases where um, insects have had issues um, feeding off, uh, feeding off non-native plants um, in terms of toxicity? Have they been affected by that? Have there been cases of that? Um, Grace said it's more, it, because plants don't store um, toxic, compounds in their pollen or nectar, it's more of a concern for your um, leaf tissue. And I, I have read studies where they've looked at comparing the nutritional value of like the non-native plant versus the native plant it co-evolved with. And I'm happy to dig that up if you're interested. Um, and they've found in, in different cases like, oh yeah, that non-native plant, like 
it gets them by, but it doesn't quite have the nutritional density as their native plant. So broods may be smaller, you know, they're not gonna, there's not gonna be as much of a survival rate. Um, I don't, I don't wanna say that in an umbrella term because I think it really depends on the insect and the plant, but there have been cases where it's more of a nutritional, uh, nutritional difference in the native versus non-native. Yeah. I imagine it'd be really hard to study that, you know? Actually, you'd be surprised. Yeah. There's, um, it's more like, how big did you get this week eating that non-native plant? <laughs> uh, it, it's a lot of like uh, collecting of pollen off of insects and to see what it is. And then like uh, chemical analysis of pollen. Wow. Yeah. I'd love to get into that. That sounds cool. Um, any other questions from the live audience? Okay, we will move on to, I know, yeah, <laughs> now I'm worried. <laughs> All right, we got a, a David Robertson. Are the percentages of native and non-native plants, slide 16, the numbers of plants or the coverage of plants? That's the number of plants. So out of 81%, uh, 80, oh, already messing this up. Out of 81 total species that we found, 60% of them are non-native. Um, now what I, I, I must, I know I confused this. Oh, let me just go back to that slide. You felt better than I said a lot. <laughs> So um, what I will say is, so yes, this is out of the 81 number of plants. So, um, so that's 60% out of the 81. Now, I will say from this list that are the, the, the um, plants, these are the most well distributed. So in terms of, um, in terms of coverage throughout the site, these are like the top five. And uh, I think I failed to mention this. Yeah, I definitely did. But when I did, um, when I looked at the plants and recorded which ones I found, I also recorded percent abundance of each species in here. So that way I had a record of how, how out of the 100% of which is this square, you know, the porcelain berry could be like 20% of the square or more. And that was the case in a ton of these quadrats. So really well distributed and um, just like high coverage throughout the sites. Um, sorry for the confusion. Okay, Frida. Please comment on whether if you are going to have a lawn, is it better to plant clover both for the flowering and for the nitrogen provided? Um, so the clover is the Dutch clover and the, the purple clover, um, trifolium pretense, those are not native. I mean, they're, they're practically naturalized. They're from Europe. Um, they will fix nitrogen. Um, I would say if you're going this route, you'd have better luck with like a cover crop, but obviously that's like larger scale planting um, just because they're going to be, um, unless you're planting like a whole swath, then they will fix the nitrogen for you. But um it might be tough to like reduce their cover, but like we said, less nectar is uh, more nectar being, let me just restate that. So any nectar is better than no nectar. I would, I would hesitate to tell you to just plant all clover, you know, it would be really hard. Um, it'd be hard to come back from that. Um, and you might be better served like, planting natives if you're going to go through all that effort. Um, I would get a soil test first to really see if you need that nitrogen anyway. Um, 
Let's see, I'm seeing local insect management company advertising that says he will kill all your wasp spiders and other bugs. How do we counter this message? Well, unfortunately, like because the aesthetics and the uniformity of lawns are like the big emphasis around here, they want to just, yeah, kill the nuisance wasps, kill um, any bugs that are going to be on your lawn and interfere with your work. Uh, or your enjoyment of the lawn. Um, I would, I don't know if you want to count, I mean, you could call them and, uh, but they'll probably write you off as like a nature hippie. <laughs> Spread the word that not yeah. everything yellow and stripey is a mean, angry thing. Um, um, I, there's probably some organizations that have, already produced some nice pamphlets or educational materials that you can share with them and uh, like demonstrate an interest in like, I want these, I want insects in my, um, I want my insects in my lawn, but you're probably not the target audience. Unfortunately, there's still a fair amount of people who just want things bug free, um, but it, it might be worth a shot if you want to share any pamphlets you find. Um, Donna Rosenbaum, in leaving a small section of grass unmowed, would scattering beneficial seeds in that grass help? Um, they probably just get out competed by the grass. Um, if you want to integrate native plants in the grass, it might be worth just like putting plugs in directly. So you could start some seed in some pots and then dig into the grass and, and kind of integrate them in there. Do you have any input on that, Grace? It, the, the, the seeds are going to be snatched up by ants probably, and uh, they're gonna be out competed. So um, when integrating with grass, I'd recommend like plugs or live plants. Um, and they need some care too. You can't yeah. just plug them yeah. in and assume yeah. they're going to do fine. Yeah. You put plants in, you've got to make sure you're weeding around them to give them a chance to get established. Yeah. The same thing with seeds. If you scatter seeds, the birds will love it. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, if, if the audience on Zoom didn't hear, we had um, one of our live members say, uh, emphasize, yeah, that the if you plant plugs in, you, you need to follow up on care, um, weeding, um, and and because those, and the seeds will get snatched up by birds or other insects. So at that point, you might as well just do a garden bed um, or just like leave swaths of, um, of areas away from the grass. Just, just pay attention to the competition because your, your native plant will will be tested by the grasses. Um, if I have an area that I don't have to mow on a regular basis, but would like for it to be native meadow, when is the best time to mow? Oh, Lynette. <laughs> that is, um, it kind of depends what you have in there already. Um, I don't have to mow it every day. I if you if you're not going to mow it, I would just suggest um, converting it to a native plant bed. Um, it's going to take some work to remove the grass, but um, I'm def not an expert on landscaping, so you might want to um, talk to a couple sources. But I mean. What I would do is 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 um, just go directly for a native garden bed. Um, it's going to be uh, tough to like you can't throw seeds like 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 Donna was saying. So um, in terms of mowing, you you have any input, Grace? I just that's a tough call. You have a call. We have we have someone in the audience who've done who's done this before. Have, do you have well, any? When it comes to mowing, 
like she's talking about right. just wants to start something right um i would say low in march and there's some going to be some disagreement as mm -hmm. to plant stems and that kind of thing but right. if you just want to start converting to a meadow and you don't want to go the full bloom garden bed which takes a lot of maintenance just by stopping that mowing just see what happens and then you can start plugging things in from the right. native plant sale. Oh, I like this. I like turtle head or I like black eyed Susan. Yeah. You start plunking them in. But once a year, you have to get everything back to basically ground level, or you're going to have all this other stuff that you don't want. So you want to get rid of the woody stuff. That's the, right. the best first step to take. And then you kind of start finessing it. And then let, let the natives. Let the natives grow. We right. don't leave the non natives. Yeah. That's that it's being able to do that. Right. It, it takes time. That's yeah. going to be my question. Yeah. Can we go through and selectively cut the big fields? Could you get, you said porcelain berry, honeysuckle, I don't know what the third popular one, but say you know the top five natives and you go in there with string trimmers and keep that down. Right. And, you know, and it'll be, it's a, a, a bit of a talent to be able to go through and, and do that, but as an experiment. <laughs> what is that experiment? That's it. Cutters who works with um, the New Jersey Energy Company, I forget what they call it, um, where they are trying to keep right of ways, rights of way, clear. Mm -hmm. um, and she started working with them to see about also making it pollinator friendly. And they have had extreme success with no mowing and just like, I think she said maybe once or twice a year, they just go out and selectively cut stuff down. Mm -hmm. And within a few years, they actually have, it, it actually ends up taking a lot less maintenance overall. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do, do you remember, what was her name? I love when we talk to Robert Rutgers about that. Oh, I don't, because like Kelly something, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't. I yeah, and you have like. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. see if I can find her stuff. Hit the non natives with the string trim or pull what you can pull, because it's some stuff you can't, but yeah. not let it go to seed. Not let the band stop. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna rein us in here <laughs> just because uh, we've got our our Zoom audience still here. Um, so if if you didn't hear Lynette, like uh, March would would be a good time before you even have any emergers coming out, any early insects to to kind of prep the ground is what our, our audience is recommending. I feel like I'm on, who wants to be a millionaire? What is the audience recommending? Um, <laughs> um, Kimberly Russell, if you can find yeah. any of her um, If you, you mow in finish. March and then you can try to integrate uh, plugs in there, but it, it's going to be um, a long-term kind of experiment to, to see what works for for what you have in your lawn, um, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated question. I wish I had a more straightforward answer. Um, I I really hope to be able to take some of our lawn at the trust and start experimenting with this, so I can give like, here's what we've done. Here's an answer um, for one approach. But you know, our 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 main focus here has been just to collect a baseline. What's there? And, and in terms of the plants, and then how are they interacting with our um, pollinators? So that's kind of the next step. I, I hope to answer your question eventually in this whole field of research. Um, of course, it won't be a one fits all. Um, Arcadia, so Frida says Arcadia Natives in Washington, PA has, some created, has created some great plant info sheets. Thank you, Frida. Um, I will be saving this chat and I'll post that too um, when I share. So that's a good resource to add. Arcadia Natives. There's some great little like resources hiding out. Um, Andrew says the native mustard 
white butterfly will lay its eggs on garlic mustard, which is unfortunately toxic to caterpillars. So that is, that is an example of an invasive plant that is actually toxic and kills the insects that tries to use it as a host. So there's your answer, Sam. The mustard white butterfly and garlic mustard. I didn't know that. Wow. Well, the garlic mustard is allelopathic. So, you know, it basically exudes chemicals that stunts plant growth and can often even kill them. So that's really interesting that it works on insects too. Come on. There's just so much to learn. But you were saying to Grace too, the larva stage is yeah. where they would try to protect themselves. They don't care about, they, they want to spread their pollen and nectar basically. Yeah, and right. That would be where they would concentrate poison. Uh, Jean, I've got the, um, she asked to see the uh, Audubon Mid-Atlantic chapter. So go just um, go to, uh, you can just Google Audubon Mid-Atlantic plant diagrams or, or grab this website here at the bottom. Um, and it has tons of different templates. Um, the PADCNR, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources also has some diagrams. Okay, One of thank you. One of the books that I recommended last week by Great. Heather Holm has some uh, example diagrams in the back of different sun shade stuff as well. Oh, so. good. Uh, actually, it's funny. Frida just said she shared some of Heather Holm's videos. There you go. Ah, Heather Holm's amazing. I love her. Yeah, I, I haven't. I gotta look that up too. Huh. Um, thank you. Is, oh, thank you. Lynette says the area is too big to be a plant bed. Uh, um, we're going to talk to you separately, Lynette. <laughs> I know where you live. Turn <laughs> it out. Yeah. I, it would be great to just have like, here's, here's multiple different scenarios you can take and, and try it out. I, I, yeah. It's going to be experimental with everyone's. Lawns. It, it would be worth a try to selectively just cut back the, the invasives if you can find enough time to do that a few times a, a growing season. You might have some success that way. Yeah. Um, how beneficial is the native species PA sedge for pollinators? Incredibly easy to maintain. I never mow it at all and it eventually flops over. I've heard of this. Um, there's like sedges that you can put in lieu of plants, uh, in, in lieu of the typical um, bluegrass, or Kentucky bluegrass in your lawn. So a sedge would be a poaceae, right? Uh, a cyperaceae. Yeah. So that I believe is wind pollinated. Um, and so it wouldn't be a pollinating, supporting plant directly. But it would be like... But it would be better than mowing things. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I mean, planting native sedges would be an interesting... I know like Mount Cuba... Did, oh, someone actually... Frida, Frida's got all the answers tonight, guys. Uh, Frida, You're post, higher, Frida. Yeah, fine. fine call me, Frida. <laughs> um, Mount Cuba, yeah, they're well known for doing trials, um, different sedges. They, they actually have now started producing, um, you know, certain cultivars that they can just um, sell to nurseries and then they sell to people, so native plants. Um, oh, I think they're yeah. the place that I used to do germination tests. For. Yeah, they do okay. germination tests. They've got tons of beds and experimental plots and sedges, like specifically Carex is one of their big, yeah, but, uh, big projects. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Andrew, oh, Andrew was addressing uh, Robin's, yeah. Pennsylvania sedge is wind pollinated probably has little direct value to pollinators in that way. Although it is a host plant to up to 36 butterflies and moths in our areas. Yeah, that's a good point, Andrew. So if you look at um, like a, uh, 
There's several of the resources I listed. They talk about different um, butterfly moth relationships with sedges and also things like little blue stem and different broom sedges we have. And I personally, if you want to have like statement pieces, you know, rather than having like the two lion statues in front of your house, like have two big like little blue stems or like the big grasses, they're beautiful, like clumped grasses, native, like a lot of them, like little blue stem will support um, some of our native pollinators and they look great. And even when they dry up, and they're all brown, they look great. So I would I would totally go for some grasses as statement pieces. Um, they're nice and planners too. Yeah, they're nice and planners. Um, Paige says she started a nonprofit to help people replace their lawns with native plants, journeywork.org. People can email me if they'd like us to look at their yards. Nice. Oh, wow, well, let me look that up. <laughs> Journey journeywork.org and that's Paige Menton M-E-N-T-O-N How many people do you have on that team? Uh, 13 I think our max is 15 A lot of, a lot of folks like involved in, in this this is great uh, All right uh, Robin Eisman, sorry, Robin Eisman, says uh, Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve has great resources too, including what natives to plant, in you know what conditions, and lots, um, lots more. So, yeah, that's another great place to visit right now. Lots of spring ephemerals. If you wanted to go that route for early spring emerging uh, insects, Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. Um, again, I'm going to share this chat, so don't worry about like furiously scribbling. Um, Eric Frankhauser says, all of these are great suggestions, but it depends heavily on the size of the land area. Absolutely. For example, a wildflower garden bed can be meticulously maintained by hand weeding, but a fourth acre will require a different approach. Uh, however, any approach requires eradication of invasives, preferably prior to planting, or they will be a constant problem hindering your native plants. Absolutely. Um, the, the garden beds that I recommend are, are um, you can kind of, I think you can get, if you're willing to do the work, you can do a bigger area, but I, I'm kind of advocating for like, some nice beds around the house that are um, that are better than um, just putting in non-native shrubs or, or things like that. Um, and it's a little bit you you know that you're contributing um, native habitat without having to mess around with your lawn. Yeah, I I, I think you're you're right, Eric. The the bigger swaths, even bigger than a fourth of an acre, will require some more forethought. Um, even if you think back to like the, the refugia uh, slides that I showed you where um, it's just like, go back, where, where it is bigger areas, but you have to um, be strategic, remove those invasive plants and, and really think about um, how you're going to integrate the native plants into what is already lawn, yeah. Uh, Frida, Lehigh Gap, Nature Center has a booklet and templates. So there you go. Um, Ernst Conservation Seeds sells 72 plug flats of PA sedge for pickup in Meadville. Oh, it's Freda. I'm so sorry, Freda. <laughs> um, thanks for that clarification. Uh, yeah, Ernst Conservation Seeds, that's really good for bulk seeds. We actually buy for larger seeding areas at the trust, we will buy from them. They're really um, amenable to doing like personal customized mixes of, of you know, grasses and wildflowers. Um, so great for kind of big, bigger uh, bulk seed orders. Um, some of these other places do smaller, you know, packets or plugs, more better for commercial enterprises. 
Uh, Mary Catherine says, sedges are incredible for habitat and new moon nursery website will show which characters support insects. So great, that's another resource, uh, new moon nursery. That's another place that we also get some stock from. Uh, Eric mentioned the Ladybird Wildflower Center. Yeah, that's a great website for information about wildflowers. Um, yeah, and it does tell you a lot about each species, what are their preferred conditions. So yeah, lots of good resources. Uh, PA DCNR has an actual person working in the area of lawn conversion. Yeah, I've heard there's a grant, there's a program you can actually get involved with um, to, to like have them work with you to convert your lawn. It's a fairly new program. Um, there are some pretty specific requirements in terms of how you manage the lawn and how big it is, but it might be worth looking into for some of you guys. Um, so that's that if you if you Google PA DCNR and then lawn conversion program, um, that should come up. Um, and Fredus is also working with our local water authority to do a test lawn conversion in one of the properties. Um, and she's working with Earned Seeds to speak and, 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 and figure out those details. You can buy an ounce of seed, um, she says. So yeah, you can small buy smaller amounts. Um, can I jump in and make a comment? Yeah, yes. Um, you know, we can give these sorts of talks until we're blue in the face to the people who would already come to these sorts of talks. But if you want to spread the word, the best thing you can do is have a beautiful lawn that supports natives. So yeah. any of you out there who are better gardeners than me, you're doing more work towards spreading the word than I could ever do. Right. Now, that's a good point. I mean, I feel like our audience here tonight, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, like all of you here are already wanting to do this or doing your due diligence to learn more. And and the, the, the people out there who I would love to jump on board are, are probably your neighbors or, or other other people. So yeah, just by gardening and, and bringing native plants in, you're, you're doing a lot, way more than the average person. And I'm really glad to have you all tonight, you know, to talk about how you could go even further and, and, and contribute more. Uh, Lynette says, signage in your yard, that yeah. it's good for pollinators. That's a great thing too. You could get your neighbors talking. Um, you can have people just seeing that, sees that, like shows when you're driving by, like, oh, that's an interest people have, or I should look into that. Um, life is just so fast paced these days that like people don't have the time or they're intimidated by this process. And it can be as simple as like, I'm going to clear this area under my two windows of the house and I'm going to plant 10 plants and that's my native garden. Like it can be really simple. Um, I know we're all really interested in, in, in minimizing the lawn because it's not a very ecologically functional land cover, but it, it is a long-term process. And, and like I said, starting small is, is great. Um, Freda says her front lawn is mostly taller shrubs with a perennial bed near the house and a few perennial islands. Lots of Pennsylvania sedge around the shrubs. And she mows an edge and she has two signs, Master Gardener, which is another great resource, and Watershed Stewards, another great resource. So uh, you all have to put where your where your addresses are so I can come and scope out your lawn. I know, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, Grace is coming for your <laughs> lawns, guys. <laughs> you have to walk by your house sometimes. They're poking around, looking what's in there. <laughs> Uh, Robin also says you can get signage from Audubon National Wildlife Federation. And I think Xerxes also does signage, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And then there's um, uh, Homegrown National Park. That's uh, Doug Tallamy's website. Lots of resources on there and you can get registered there as a Homegrown National Park, which is a pretty cool designation. Um, they have a whole database on there. Um, it's 8.31. Uh, we, we said we end at 8.30. I want to, I don't want to hold you. Uh, it is a weeknight. 
Um, any final questions or comments from live or Zoom audience before we close up? Um, oh, yeah, Dave says, I did a wonderful job of my presentation and he's, he's thanking us for our work. Thank you very much for caring. And I'm, I'm, you know, Grace and I are going to actually do some research, the same protocols we've developed um, at Raytharn um, at the Trust. And so we, we may have some updates for you in a little while. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for caring about wildlife, about native plants, about uh, supporting our native communities. And um, this recording will be available online. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.